Well, we're at a great point in our studies in 1 Corinthians, one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So make your way, make your way in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the great resurrection chapter, 58 verses in which Paul deals with the theme of the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of believers. And so it's going to take us um, at least another week, maybe two more weeks to uh, cover this. And then that'll be woefully inadequate because whole books have been written on this chapter. In fact, I had one in my library. I've since given it away. It was about almost 500 pages just on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So again, we'll look at uh, verses 1 through 12. But for the sake of time, rather than read them and then go back over them again, we'll just we'll just pick them up when we're ready for them at the point of uh, at the point we're making. Now, Corinth was a was a Greek city, and the Greeks didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. In Acts seventeen thirty two, Paul is preaching at Athens, and when he came to the point of declaring the fact of Christ's resurrection, some of his believers, some of the listeners, rather not believers, but some of the listeners laughed at him. They ridiculed him. And that's because they'd been taught by the Greek philosophers that the human body was a prison and that death was to be welcomed as a deliverance from bondage. So when, when a Greek died, they believed that that's a good thing because the real person is set free from the bondage to this body. Now, this skeptical attitude had somehow invaded the church at Corinth, and Paul had to face it head on because it was a, a key truth, a foundational truth with great doctrinal and practical implications, far too important to just uh, ignore. But today's teaching focuses our attention upon the very cornerstone, the main and largest foundational support of the Christian faith, and that is the resurrection, not only of Christ, but in detail, the resurrection of the body. Now listen closely. It's the resurrection of the bodily dead to bodily life. It's, you, you've probably been asked, or I have asked someone, do you believe in life after death? And there's a lot of talk about life after death. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. It's not life after death. It's bodily life after bodily death. In other words, it's not just a spirit that we exist in after we've, been, after we've died. We get a new body, a resurrection body at the end of history, a glorified resurrection body. So it's life after life after death. And so that's what we're looking at today. If the bodily resurrection of the dead, beginning with the firstborn from the dead, Jesus is only a fable, a fictitious story, a fanciful parable, then the road to the grave is a one-way, dead-end street, and life is a hopeless riddle, and we Christians are, of all people, most miserable. In March of 1992, a letter was mailed to the Department of Health and Human Services notifying a person that their benefits were about to be terminated. The letter read as follows. Your food stamps will be stopped effective March 1992 because we have received notice that you have passed away. May God bless you. You may reapply if your circumstances change. <laughs> the incredibly good news of the gospel is that the Lord Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, has so fixed our liabilities to past debts, present desires, and future destiny that when we come to saving faith in Him, our circumstances change immediately and eternally. We get married to Christ and have eternal benefits automatically applied to us with no opportunities for divorce. And that's good news. Amen? We can live in the insurance and full assurance that death will not destroy us or defraud us of our inheritance. So, the first big idea, Roman numeral number one, the scriptural explanation for what the gospel is about. The scriptural explanation for what the gospel is about. 
John Piper reveals that the gospel, as declared by Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 4, has six elements, five are which five which are specific to the text, and one is implied in the text, and that's verses 1 through 4. So unable to improve on what Dr. Piper wrote, I'm going to borrow his lengthy explanation. But first, let me read verses 1 through 4. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures." Now, here are the six elements, five very clear. The other is just uh, a, an, an inference and a, a deduction, a proper one, that P Dr. Piper made from what Paul has said here. Number one, the gospel is a divine plan. Verse three, the B part, Christ died for our sins. How? In accordance with the scriptures. That is, in accordance with the Old Testament scriptures written hundreds of years before Jesus died. And that means that the gospel was planned by God long before it took place. Then secondly, the gospel is not only a divine plan, but the gospel is a historical event. Christ died. That means the gospel is not mythology, it's not literary fiction, it's an historical event, and without the event, there is no gospel. There's some notes right there saying that you can get one. Uh, the gospel, then, is, a, is an historical event, and without the event, there's no gospel. By the way, if any of these five elements that, that I'm mentioning here are missing, just one of them, then there's no gospel. It's not a gospel. It's, it's not good news. So the gospel is a divine plan. It's a historical event. And then number three, the gospel is the divine achievements through that event and that death. In other words, things God accomplished in the death of Jesus long before we ever existed. Notice again, verse three, Christ died for our sins. For our sins means that his death had design in it. It was meant to accomplish something. It accomplished the covering of our sins, the removal of God's wrath, the removal of shame, dishonor, and spiritual uncleanness. It also purchased eternal life for us beginning now. That's, uh, script, uh, there's scripture for all of that. These are objective achievements of the work of Christ before they are applied to anyone. Number four, the gospel is a free offer of Christ for faith. A free offer, the good news of God's achievements in Christ becomes ours by faith. That is, by believing and receiving and not by achieving. That's worth repeating. By believing and receiving, not by achieving through religious performance or deserving or working for salvation. It's a gift of God. And all that can happen to a gift is it be received. If you work for it, it's not a gift. It's wages that you have earned. So what God has done is free to all who will have it. It's received by faith. And without the free offer of Christ for faith, without the free offer of Christ for faith, there would be no gospel. Number five, the gospel is an application to believers of what God achieved in the death of Jesus. So when we believe, we're forgiven our sins, Acts 10, 43. We're justified, Romans 5, 1. We have eternal life, John 3, 16. And dozens and dozens of other benefits. The gospel then is the powerful application to us of what Jesus achieved for us on the cross. And none of that is applicable and none of it means anything and none of it is really true without what we're talking about today and that is the resurrection first and foremost of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 
The gospel is the enjoyment of fellowship with God himself. John Piper sums up the prize of the gospel as he says, this truth is implicit in the word gospel or good news. If you ask what is the highest, the deepest, the most satisfying, all-encompassing good of the good news, the answer is God himself known and enjoyed by his people. This point is made explicit in 1 Peter 3.18. Christ, this is what the verse says, Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Now listen closely. That he might bring us to God. All the other gifts of the gospel exist to make this one possible. The prize of the gospel is the person who paid the price. In other words, it's not just being forgiven. It's not going to heaven when you die. It's not being justified from our condemnation. All of that's good, but what that does is remove everything that keeps us away from God so that we can enjoy Him. The purpose of the, the redemptive purpose of God is that we come back into an ever living, ever loving, everlasting relationship with Him. So test your heart. Why do you want forgiveness? Why do you want to be justified? Many people say, well, I don't want to go to hell when I die. Well, who wants to if they believe in a place? Um, I want to go to heaven to see mama or daddy or loved ones. Well, I mean, anybody that has a heart wants, wants to do that. Why do you want eternal life? Is the decisive answer because I want to enjoy God. Because the prize of the gospel, the price of the gospel is God in Christ. It's the person who paid the price. The gospel love God gives is ultimately the gift of himself. This is what we were made for. This is what we lost in our sin. This is what Christ came to restore. One of my favorite passages, Psalm 16, verse 11. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Listen, pleasures forevermore. So there's the scriptural explanation for what the gospel is about. And then in verses three through eight, we have the historical evidence for the resurrection, which the gospel provides. The historical evidence for the resurrection, which the gospel provides. Notice first, the foundation of Paul's case for the resurrection. The basis for Paul's assertion of the resurrection of Christ is found in two phrases in these, in these verses. Number one, according to the scriptures. Paul says Christ died for our sins. How? How do we know that? According to the scriptures. And then he says he was buried and rose again on the third day. How do we know that? According to the scriptures. So number one, according to the scriptures. And number two, the gospel. That's two key phrases. Now, when we come to this phrase, according to the scriptures, there are three things I want to point out. The resurrection of Jesus was often prefigured in the Old Testament. Jesus himself cited the history of the prophet Jonah as a sign of his resurrection. He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew twelve forty. The Feast of first fruits is another picture of the resurrection of Christ. If you drop down in your text in 1 Corinthians to verse 20, Paul says, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. That's an Old Testament concept. So Jesus' resurrection was prefigured in the Old Testament. Secondly, the resurrection of Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus, speaking through the voice of prophecy in Psalm 16.10, said, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let, let your Holy One see corruption. And then, in the greatest Messianic chapter of the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, in particular verses 8 through 11, the prophet wrote of the resurrection of the Messiah after intense sufferings and death. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now what that says is, after vicariously suffering and dying for the sins and transgressions of sinful men, the Messiah would live again and have many offspring as his spiritual family. He shall see his seed, his offspring, and, 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 and prosper, and, and he'll be satisfied. So there's more than just Isaiah and Psalms, but those are enough to prove that the resurrection of Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament. And then number three, the resurrection was predicted by Jesus himself in the New Testament. Numerous times before the actual event, Jesus clearly and carefully predicted the event of his resurrection, the very day of his res resurrection, the place of his resurrection, and the importance of his resurrection. For example, when his disciples uh, made complete and clear acknowledgement of his identity and deity in Matthew 16, verse 16, where Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The scripture goes on and says, From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how, that he, how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and listen, this is Jesus speaking, and be raised again the third day. That's Matthew 16, 21. So the foundation of Paul's case for the resurrection is clear. It's according to the scriptures in the gospel. It's prefigured, it's prophesied, and predicted. But let's look at the facts that confirm the bodily resurrection of Christ. First, the valid assertions of Paul concerning Jesus. Listen again, verse 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and raised on the third day. Three things there. He died, he was buried, and raised the third day. Let's look at these. Christ died for our sins. Paul asserts that Christ died, and that's in the Greek a tense called aorist, which means point action in time, which simply says this is a historical event. We're not dealing with some myth. We're not dealing with some uh, fable that Paul conjured up. This is an actual historical event with a measurable point in history. And this is incredibly glorious and marvelous. It is a marvel that Christ could die. It's a greater marvel that he would die. It's an even greater mar mar marvel that he should die. And the greatest marvel, the greatest astonishment, the greatest thing of all is that he did die for our sins. But Paul asserts that Jesus' death was more than just a mere fact of history. He died according to the scriptures as a fact of the gospel. The historical fact is also given a theological and personal explanation in this little phrase, for our sins, for our sins. So he is a Messiah indeed, a deliverer in fact. It was to deal with our most deadly enemy that he died. Secondly, he was buried, verse 4. The actual historical fact of Christ's burial is recorded at a critical place to prove the reality of his death and substantiate the reality of his resurrection. The burial of Christ's body is mentioned in all four of the gospel accounts. Now don't miss this. The burial of a dead body is the necessary prelude of the empty tomb. The gospels supply the above facts surrounding Christ's burial to show that Jesus was actually dead. But there's an even greater reason for recording the burial of Jesus. The burial of Jesus is recorded to be able to point to the empty tomb as the first proof of the resurrection. And then the first proof of the resurrection is the empty tomb, but it's also the first problem of the doubters of the resurrection. After the critics have done all they can, they still must face the fact of the empty tomb. And there's been all kinds of explanations about the empty tomb. His disciples told it, uh, yada, yada. I'm going to give you three possibilities concerning the ancient, uh, uh, concerning the uh, empty tomb. But before I do that, notice 
Again, the, the end of verse 4, he was raised from the dead. When the first visitors arrived at the place of burial early that Sunday morning, they found the tomb empty. Now, it must have been emptied in one of two ways, by human power or by superhuman power. There's simply no other possibilities. If it was emptied by human power, then there are two possibilities. Follow closely with me. This is a powerful apologetic, a defense of the uh, resurrection and the empty tomb. Number one, it was emptied by the foes of Jesus, the enemies of Jesus. That is, they came, those who hated Jesus, wanted to destroy him, they came and removed the body. What's the problem with The problem is, uh, this proves fatal to the theory that they would have done it. Why would they have done it? And if they did, they could have silenced the gospel message forever. How? By simply dragging out a dead body. If they stole the body, had the body, then all they had to do when the disciples, seven weeks later on the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up in Acts 2, verses 23 and 24, and says that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he's seen him personally. And all that was necessary for the Jews to have silenced him was to drag out the dead body of Jesus. And they didn't do so. Why? Because they didn't have the body. One professor of theology says, the silence of the Jews is as significant as the speech of the Christians. In other words, they didn't have a body. They, they, all they could say is his disciples stole the body. The necessary conclusion is that the enemies of Jesus did not produce the body of Jesus. Why? Because they could not produce the body. So number one, the empty tomb is tried to, it tries to be, it has, has been tried to be explained away by the fact that the enemies of Jesus took the body. But there's a second possibility. The tomb was emptied by the friends of Jesus. That is his his disciples, his followers, took the body. But the question that proves fatal to this theory is, could they have done it? And even if they could have done it, did they? The very idea is totally unrealistic and even impossible. Think about it. A group of frightened, untrained, unequipped Galilean peasants overpowering probably as many as 16 trained uh, war-tested, proven Roman soldiers, overpower them, roll a two-ton stone back up its steep groove, and steal away a dead body, and then stop to somehow get him out of the grave clothes without messing them up and rearranging them so that they're all proper and in place, just like the body evaporated through the grave clothes. Now, that's a pretty good undertaking. Uh, in fact, it's an impossible undertaking. But suppose the disciples or friends of Jesus did steal the body. If they did, then they turned the world upside down with a lie, knowing it wasn't true, and then died with unanim with 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 uh, 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 unshakable testimony for this lie. Unanimous and unshakable testimony for a lie. Nobody's going to die for a, a lie that they concocted themselves unless you're crazy. And, and the world was not changed by simply a crazy group of disciples in the first century. So the very idea is totally uh, impossible and defies everything we know about human reason and experience. Their one and only gain would have been the privilege of living, fighting, and dying for a known lie. And what a lie. Mm -hmm. No, this is not a real possibility to a reasonable person. The number three, if, if humans didn't do it, if the foes didn't do it, if the friends of didn't, didn't, didn't do it, then the third possibility is the tomb was emptied by the Father himself, by the Father of Jesus. God raised his son from the dead in the power of an endless life. In Acts 26, 8, the apostle Paul Ask this unanswerable question. Why should it be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? Given God and the kind of God he is, 
it would be unthinkable that such a person as Jesus were not raised from the dead. Thus, the Bible says it was not possible that he should be held by death. God raised his son from the dead, and the day of his resurrection was the day God started, listen, a world revolutionary movement called Christianity. So we have not only, uh, n not only the, uh, the valid assertions of Paul concerning Jesus, but notice number two, the verifiable appearances of Jesus. This is, this is in uh, verses 5 and, and uh, five through 8. That he appeared to Cephas, that's the Aramaic word for Peter, then to the twelve. Notice the, the thens there. Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for death. Then, so we have four thens. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So he appeared to friends and he appeared to skeptics. There are two big skeptics in that list. The first one is James. That's the half-brother of Jesus, and he did not believe in Jesus. He lived with him in the home. He watched his ministry for three and a half years. He watched him die on the cross. But Jesus appeared personally to James, and at that revelation, James was born of the Spirit of God and died a martyr for his half-brother, but the only Savior of sinners. So that skeptic was converted. Then Paul, I love what he says here. That word untimely means like a miscarriage or an abortion. Uh, Paul says, I, it, it was like I was torn from the womb. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting to be born again. I wasn't waiting to be born again. I wasn't looking for a Messiah. I was on my way to, to silence all of those who claim to be followers of this despised Nazarene. And God arrested me on that Damascus road. That's what he uses, the word arrest. He arrested me, and as it were, he tore me out and birthed me into a new creation in Christ Jesus. I was like an abortion, and only this time it was a timely one because it resulted in my being born by the Spirit into the family of God. So the persecutor becomes the foremost preacher. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. Amen. The verifiable appearances of Jesus. And then number three, the victorious advances of the church. This, this is another demonstration of the, of the proof of the resurrection of Christ. So what does the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ mean? Well, I've got 10 things, and I'm going to just mention them without comment. They're good, so listen. It means that God's new creation is launched upon a surprised world, pointing ahead to the redemption and the renewal of the entire creation. Jesus is risen Therefore, God's new world has begun, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has died and passed away. Behold, the new has come. Jesus is risen. Therefore, God's verdict against his people has been transposed into God's justification and vindication of us. Jesus is risen. Therefore, his kingdom has been definitively established is being progressively extended and will be finally victoriously consummated. Jesus is risen. Therefore, the tyrants and despots of the world should tremble and quiver because God has exalted Jesus and one day every knee shall bow before him. Jesus is risen. Therefore, the true Israel of God has been restored and the plan for the nation is fulfilled in him. Jesus is risen, therefore death has been defeated. Jesus is risen, therefore creation groans in anticipation of the final reversal and removal of the curse. That's in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. Jesus is risen, therefore we will also be raised to live forever in God's new creation. Jesus is risen, therefore we are to go and make disciples in his name. The resurrection means that we have the task of proclaiming, embodying, and demonstrating before the world exactly what this new creation is and what it looks like. 
Paul concludes his great resurrection dissertation in chapter 15 in verse 58. He doesn't say, well, let's celebrate because we're all going to heaven. And heaven is for dead people in Christ, but we're alive in Christ now. So there's a greater purpose than just going to heaven when you die. He says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and steadfast, always enthusiastic about the Lord's work. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. In other words, resurrection means we mission. Resurrection means we've got an assignment. We've got a, a purpose for being here. And, and our assignment is declared that Christ is Lord, that, his, that, his, that, that the Father's name is to be hallowed, His kingdom is to come more fully, His will is to be done more freely. How? On earth as it's being done in heaven. And that's now, not just in the sweet by and by. So, His resurrection should fill His, pe fill his people with confidence that it's not based upon things getting better, are men fixing everything? Our confidence should rest in the power of the gospel, which is good news based upon the successful labors of Christ at his first advent and the present ministry of the Holy Spirit in his empowerment of the people of God with the word of God so that they're expecting to see the ever-increasing victories of the kingdom grow more and more. Now, if you want to know who you are as a child of God, there are many names, but one is a kerox, a herald. That's the Greek word, kerygma. The, 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 the uh, announcement is called the kerygma of the gospel, the good news. And the person who does that is a K-E-R-U-X, a kerox. You didn't know you were that, did you, Elizabeth? You're a kerox. You're a character kerox. <laughs> So as that, we, we're heralds of the king. We announce that through the death, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement of King Jesus, Jesus in heaven, a new order of things has come into being. Not just something in an individual's heart, but a new reality in history. The fullness of time has come. A new creation has been birthed. The long-anticipated age of the Spirit foretold by Job, uh, not Job, by Joel has arrived. Now the last days of this present age has come as well as the new world order of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The reason to believe and repent isn't just to go to heaven when you die, get peace in your heart now, get a happy mar happier marriage and better kids. The reason to repent and believe is quite simple. God has made this Jesus whom was crucified, both Lord and Christ. And this being true, there are no other options other than rebellion and more religion. So it's repent or perish because God has raised up Jesus and made him both Lord and Christ. So listen, in Christ, we are truly the people of the new world order, the people of a new age, already participants in a new heaven and a new earth, not the way it's going to be, but already a forced taste of that is our experience. We're part of the new Israel, a new kingdom, a new Jerusalem, a new sanctuary, and we have a new inheritance because resurrection life is abundantly available and powerful act actively, powerfully active in our life. Because of that, our uplook to King Jesus can be rightly focused. And when it is, our outlook for ministry can be fruitfully exercised. When resurrection power fills me this hour, our obedience and our outreach will be progressive and our prayers will be effective, our joy will be contagious, and our hope will be motivating. That's good news based on the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus and the sending back of one just like him minus a body, third person of the Trinity, Holy Spirit, who's resident within us, reigning within us, waiting to be released through us so that resurrection power can do what resurrection power does best, and that is impact dead situations. Know any dead situations and dead people? Do not despair. Christ can say, just as he said to Paul, hey, who do you think you are? You're, you're persecuting me. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. 
the resurrected reigning Lord Jesus. That's good news. So I want to challenge you, especially those of you who are watching this video, and maybe you're watching as an unbeliever. If so, investigate the tomb. Investigate the empty tomb. Don't write Christianity off as a crutch for people who can't help themselves, who are weak-minded, or write it off just as another religion. Investigate the historical evidence of Jesus' empty tomb. Many who were honest enough to do so found their lives changed forever. Let me give you two examples. Lou Wallace intended to write a book presenting Jesus as a mere man. The problem was that Lou Wallace had never even bothered to consider the evidence. He hadn't even read the Gospels. So he concluded that if he was going to write such a book, he should at least have the intellectual honesty to examine the evidence. So he began to pour over and ponder the evidence for the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. And as a result, he was captured by the gospel and changed forever, regenerated by the Spirit of God based upon the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. And he went on to write an incredibly famous book entitled Ben-Hur, the movie Ben-Hur. And in that movie, if you watched it, he declares without equivocation the deity of Jesus Christ. And then Simon Greenlee, back in the 1700s, was an outstanding professor of law at Harvard University. He wrote a book that is still used in many law schools today on the basis for determining evidence in a court of law. But Simon Greenlee was an unbeliever who constantly ridiculed Christians. After listening to one of his tirades against Christianity, one of his students came up to him after the class and challenged him to use the same procedure that he had developed to determine evidence in a court of law and apply that to the resurrection of Jesus. He said, okay, I will. So using the same principles for determining evidence in a court of law. He pondered and poured over the accounts of Jesus' resurrection, the empty tomb, and he he come to the conclusion, this is a historical reality. And as a result of that, God captured his heart, changed his life, and he was born again. <laughs> One Bible scholar rightly said, the gospel without a resurrection is not merely a gospel without its final chapter. It's no gospel at all. Everything that makes the gospel a gospel, that is good news, is suspended on the empty tomb and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. An elementary school teacher asked her pupils one day, who is the greatest living man? And gave them a chance to uh, write the name on paper. She collected the papers and she found the names of several prominent people. But one little boy had written the name of Jesus on his slip of paper. Taking note of this answer, the teacher said to the class, I said, who is the greatest living man? The little boy replied, but teacher, Jesus is living. And he was right. And what if he was wrong? The apostle Paul, for the sake of argument, forces us to face that question in these verses that are going to, we're going to study next week. He makes Christianity answer with his life for the little, literal truth of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If Christ be not risen, he says, forcing us to face earth's blackest assumption. If Christ be not risen, what then? Well, there are grave consequences. And like I said, we're going to look at those next week if Christ is not risen. Until then, rejoice, Christ lives, and He is Lord over all. Amen? Amen.